Okay, welcome. Uh, welcome to the session about device tree and how to get your device tree bindings accepted in less than 10 iterations. My name is Krzysztof Kozłowski. Uh, if you don't know how to pronounce my name, it can be just Krzysztof. Works perfectly fine. So I work for Renaro in Qualcomm landing team. I upstream few, uh, some support for uh, Qualcomm SOCs. I'm also co-maintainer of the device tree bindings in the Linux kernel and I take care about a few other things as well in the kernel, a few other subsystems there. And this is about Unaro services. Okay, what the topic would be about. So I will say a few words about the generic rules about the bindings in the Linux kernel. I will show how to use the DT schema. Also, I will explain a bit what is this DT schema. The main part of the topic would be do's and don'ts, so what, as a reviewer, I kind of expect from the bindings. Uh, the presentation finishes with something which I call reusable patterns. I will not be going through this. I keep them on, on this presentation so you can use them in your upstreaming process. And there are also other references so you can use the slides in your work. If there are questions, we can leave them till the end, but actually you could also interrupt me and if you see something interesting, just ask a question during the, the talk. So short uh, disclaimer that DMSG bindings are used in several projects. However, I maintain the Linux kernel. Therefore, the entire talk is focused on the Linux kernel device free bindings. Uh, the guidelines here are mostly based on the experience and also the guidelines sometimes change. And on, during the review on the mailing list, some things might be different than I tell you here. Sorry, I mean, uh, the maintenance decision overrule whatever I wrote here. Okay, what are the uh, bindings and device tree schema? Uh, device tree sources, so the DTS, I hope that everyone on in this audience know it. So the DTS describes the hardware, uh, so the kernel can use it. It's mostly for the cases when the hardware is non-discoverable. And now the device tree bindings uh, describes, say, what are the rules, how this DTS should be created. So similarly as the DTS, uh, the bindings also focus on the hardware. So we don't describe the Linux drivers, we don't describe anything for the operating system. We rather document the hardware, which can be used by different implementations, although, of course, we focus on the Linux kernel. So in the past, we're using the text to describe the bindings, but device tree schema or DT schema is the new format. We use YAML there, and it has certain benefits. So because it's a language, so you can, first of all, validate the bindings against the something which we call meta schema. So certain rules how the bindings should be written. But what is more important, we can validate the DTS. So you can check whether DTS has some style or some let's say, important features and therefore it conforms to the bindings, whether the DTS actually represents what bindings telling to do. The rule is that for the Linux kernel device tree bindings, all of the new bindings should be in DT schema. We don't accept anything in the text. Uh, the old bindings which are in the text, you could still extend adding their compatibles, it's okay. Uh, however, adding new properties to text bindings usually is not accepted with some exceptions. How could it look? I hope the text, the text is a bit visible. Uh, so on the left, there's a uh, DTS, there's a SPI bus with one device, it's ADC. It has a compatible, it has a unit address, reg, and it has one regulator called VREF. On the right side, there is a piece of the device tree bindings in DT schema without piece, some parts of the boilerplate. So there are some few things which I here removed uh, for the obvious reason. It starts with the title description. And again, we say what is the hardware. So the hardware is some ADC with its name. It's uh, a channel. Uh, then we list the properties. What properties do we expect? We expect the compatible. A uh, very specific one. We expect the reg with maximum one item, and there can be also the supply, which is the, this regulator, VREF, uh, VREF regulator. We list which properties are required under the list of required, and we finish the binding with the uh, keyword called additional properties false. This means that no other properties can appear. I will also mention this additional properties false later in, the, in my talk. What are the generic rules for the bindings? So we already have it documented, right? It's everything. So I'm basically uh, repeating the Linux kernel doc. First of all, they focus on the hardware, right? So uh, they should be independent of the implementation and hopefully some other 
operating systems or other projects are using the bindings, not only Linux kernel. Therefore, we, for the same reason, we try to avoid the Linuxism. So we avoid the Linux subsystem naming in the bindings. We don't describe the drivers or Linux specific subsystem. We also try to avoid describing the operating system policy. So we don't tell the operating system in the bindings what the system should do. It's not the hardware description anymore. And of course, the bindings are for the same as DTS, are for non-discoverable hardware. If your hardware can discover itself, for example, present some kind of ID, uh, version uh, ID, and then you can discover what type of block it has, or can say what type of features capabilities it has, maybe you don't need the bindings for these pieces at all. The less work for me, actually. I mean, I would have much less things to the review. When you contribute to the kernel and you send your bindings for your new device as a patches, there are a few also things which, I, which we all expect them to have. So we want them to be dual licensed, mainly because we, can, uh, we want them to be used by other projects as well, so GPL and BSD. The file name should follow certain pattern, the same as compatible, so we want the vendor comma and the name of the block. And if your bindings come with also with the headers, so these are usually located in include DT bindings, ta, 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 ta. these are also part of the bindings, the same rules, dual license, uh, naming, similar as compatible. And please don't mix the bindings with the driver code because they are describing a bit different piece of so they're describing the hardware. So we expect the bindings patches to be usually separate patch in the patch set, the best before the usage comes. A quite important property is the compatible. So what are the rules for the bindings regarding the compatible? Most important should be specific, which means that we don't accept the wildcards. And of course, on the mailing list, uh, pretty often uh, we saw uh, discussions that some bindings in the kernel already had a wildcard, therefore my device also had a wildcard. No, it's not, doesn't work like this, just because we accepted something in the past. Uh, sorry, I mean, uh, that guy was lucky, uh, you are not. So the wildcards are not allowed because we want the compatibles to be very precise. We can accept some family, uh, family names, I mean like a device family name, there are such exceptions. So usually it's for the SOC IP blocks, when one device, uh, I mean actually all devices have similar programming models. So the example here shown is this Qualcomm MDSS DSI controller. So this is the controller for the DSI in the graphics. So all of the devices have similar interface, so we accept a compatible which matches the entire family, which you still have to prepend with the specific compatible. So with the compatible matching the, the actual device. Therefore, there are two compatibles, one for SM8550 and then the generic one. What else? Uh, if you have devices which can be on multiple buses, so there are such devices for I2C or SPI, then the compatible should not include this type of the bus. I mean, uh, it's in case of the Linux kernel bindings on which bus your device resides, it, this depends on the, on the node, on the device node parent to the device. So it should not be part of the compatible. The compatible just describes the, the device and devices just, in my example, full. Very nice device name. Linux has two specific compatibles. So uh, I think these are not well, you, these are not used in other projects that come from the Linux. And this is the Syscon and Simple MFD. You can use them and see them pretty a lot in the Linux kernel, mostly around the SOC world. So every SOC will have the, at least Syscon. Uh, the main rule here is that we want them to be prepended with a device specific compatible. So Syscon and no, neither uh, Syscon and Simple MFD cannot be used alone. What are their meanings? Simple MFD means very simple multifunctional device, but the true meaning is that uh, this device doesn't provide anything for its children, or children does not depend on any of the features of the parent. This means that you cannot have in such a device, which is simple MFD, you cannot have any reset lines, you cannot have any clocks, anything, because otherwise this is not simple MFD. This is purely for very, very simple devices which you don't want to write a driver for it, and probably you should not overuse it to write your drivers with simple MFD. Just create your own device and uh, call off-platform populate to populate the children. Now the Syscon. Uh, Syscon represents 
some kind of non, uh, very generic type of register range, which contains several pieces and it's not actually responsible for one device. So they don't represent one specific device. Uh, pretty often this is called system controller and this might create, has, this might have several bits for different pieces. There's also a tendency to simplify design of all the bindings, all the DTSs that instead of writing a file node or instead of writing a reset controller, some kind of SOC developer or DTS upstreamer will push it as a syscon. And then the uh, reset client, so another device which needs to reset something, will use the syscon be handled to reset something. So please don't. The syscon is not an excuse for laziness. Please describe such dependencies uh, precisely. So if you need a reset, create a reset provider and use it from the reset consumer. This also has important uh, pieces because uh, the reset and clocks and other will guarantee you proper ordering, will guarantee your uh, prop deferral and everything, device links, everything. Okay, let's go further. So uh, the other generic rules about the bindings, so properties. We tried the properties to be uh, to representing also the hardware characteristics. So the good example is, let's say if there is some regulator, it has uh, voltage, so minimum voltage should be represented in units of the microvolts. Rather, anti-pattern would be to represent it in register values. Pretty often we accept it for, um, uh, for devices, I mean for properties specific to devices, but in general if you have a, a property which actually maps to a physical phenomena, then use the common units. And we have such units, which I will also mention a bit further. So in this case, microvolts. Okay, so this were, these were the bindings. Now, device tree schema. First of all, uh, I will not say exactly what is a device tree schema, I just simplifying it's a set of, let's say, uh, rules and entire out of three, out of the kernel, uh, application with written in uh, Python with a lot of YAML. For you, the important part is that we use their specific language, which is YAML, and how to use it. So install the package from the Python, and then you can, when you write your bindings, please test them before sending. So there are here three comments which allow you to check the bindings. Either you can test the binding themselves, or you can test entire family of bindings, in the example of uh, Qualcomm bindings or some piece of directory of the Linux kernel. And this is how you can test your binding. More interesting part is how to test your DTS. So we expect actually that uh, all the new SOC platforms which are being introduced to the uh, Linux kernel are coming with towards zero or close to zero of the uh, device tree schema validation warnings. This means that they the DTS for this new platform, at least for new sub architecture, comes without warnings when validating against the device tree schema. How to check it? So, of course, this depends, you are testing DTS, so this depends on the uh, cross compiling. You can test all of the DTSs with DTPS check, but this will take a lot of time. Therefore, you can narrow the check for the specific bindings. In the example, it's uh, trivial devices.yaml, or you can uh, even test only your DTB target. So then you run a bit different syntax. It's a make check DTBS, which checks one specific target. So in this case, uh, SM uh, Qualcomm SM8450 HDK board. You can even intersect these two. So check one board with one specific binding. No questions so far, okay. Oh, there is a question. So can you get a mic here? Uh, here on the left, my left. So, yeah, okay. Uh, I use an external DTB when I'm compiling my kernel. So, can you check an external DTB? Yes, uh, I think there's a DT validate. Uh, it's coming from the DT schema. So, if you if you install the the package, so install the DT schema, then you should have a response, proper comment. I never tried it. Uh, I work only on the upstream, <laughs> therefore please upstream your DTS, but it should also work. So it wasn't heard. And uh, the question was whether can you test, validate uh, some uh, DTB which is out of three? The answer is yes, I hope. That's the point. 
All right, let's go. So there are also a few do's and don'ts about the device three schema, so the bindings written in device three schema. So these are rules for, I hope people will follow, and this will save me a lot of time when you send the patches because I will be less grumpy and less reviewing, less job to review and uh, reviewing the patches. So what to do, what to don't do. So first of all, you can always, please always look for a standard property. We have uh, already several defined properties in the DT schema repo. We have some common properties lying in the Linux kernel. You can check the other uh, bindings, how they do it. So look for the common parts. We don't want to duplicate the properties. However, pretty often you will need property for your device, a new property, so let's say custom property, and then the rules come. You need a vendor prefix, you need the type, type is expressed with the dollar ref, uh, unless you use a standard unit, I will say about it in a second, and you should provide a description. So the code at the, at the bottom shows this example, so there's a, this is a Qualcomm property, it has a ref, it's an uh, unsigned integer 32, and there's a description saying what is this uh, property about. Now, you don't need this type, this ref, for certain things. First of all, if you use a property with a well-known suffix, so we have a list of the suffixes like microvolt or uh, even uh, microamp, thousand hertz, percent, then you don't need to pro provide the type because the DT schema expects already the type. So then you can skip it. The example is entry latency US, so microseconds. Several other properties are also defined by the DT schema. They are not exactly like units, but such example is the supply. Supply means here the regulator supply. So also there is nothing, no need to provide the time for the supply. And there is a set of common properties which are well known, like interrupts, reg, uh, what else? I don't know, resets, clocks. All of them already have defined time that these are, for example, p handles, or actually p handle array. However, you still might need to provide some constraints. So for the case for the interrupts, you need to say that. You, how many interrupts we accept, expect one interrupt in the example here. Pretty common property are the arrays. So uh, usually these are expressed like uh, with the rec, clocks, DMAs, reset lines, uh, interrupts, power domains, all of them. And there's a corresponding property called something, something names. So clock, clock names, reset names. The main rule is here that the the list, oh, both lists should be strictly ordered and we expect specific order and the names are actually a helper. Uh, this of course is not 100% true because from time to time Linux drivers depend on the names, then they're, therefore the names is not exactly the helper. But having the names should not allow you to kind of have a relaxed ordering of the array. So again, the, the items in the array are strictly ordered. We expect them to be ordered. There are of course exceptions. If you have the names, uh, don't make them redundant. So if the is this interrupt, it's enough to say that's TX interrupt, not TX IRQ. It's obvious it's IRQ. And how does it look? The easiest way to describe it with uh, the example below. So there's the clocks, uh, keyword items, which says it is an array. And uh, this array expects two items and they are defined by description. So there'll be 24 megahertz clock and there's a bus clock. Then also we need to describe the names if we use the names, and as well we use two, we expect two items, and these two items are const, so they are fixed. We expect ref and bus. This is strictly defined array, so no order can change, no other entries can appear here. Arrays can also have different flavor. So for several uh, obvious cases, you can skip description. Like here, the example of the items for the re resets are not. Uh, written because what would be the point of saying that this is the reset for the first and this is the reset for the second. So we just say the constraints, max items. If minimum items equals to max items, just say max items, it's enough. Although also there are exceptions if you define it in a all of, if then block, so in kind of conditional block. For really obvious cases like the, the reg, you just say that how many items you expect, like a max items one. If you would, would have here more of the uh, IO address space uh, ranges, then this would not be enough and we would expect to enumerate, ex say what, what is the first, what is the second, what is the third, because they are strictly specific order. But if you have just one, just say that it's max items one, I want to say more. I said 
at the beginning some time ago about the syscon uh, providers so the, the syscon block which is the system controller now about the consumer so the other side so this is also pretty often appears in many many cases this is a syscon p handle the rule here that if you have a property called syscon it's too generic it's not specific enough so it would be not good you need a vendor prefix you need some type of descriptive name so this in the example shows the sysrec system register sh shortcut and you need some type of description like that is be handled to the uh, system register uh, region it can be also described a bit better or more applicable to other cases if you have an offset so then you can uh, use p handle array for such syscon and say that you have a array of actually one item and this item has two so there are two descriptions here the first uh, is the actual p handle a second is offset several drivers already use such pattern the bindings finish with this uh, keyword called additional properties or unevaluated properties false so this keyword determines how other properties will be evaluated so these are all the properties which are not explicitly mentioned in the binding these other properties can come from device 3 schema itself or from other reference schemas anything which uh, comes from how we write the bindings so for almost 99 percent of your cases you will use either additional properties or unevaluated properties and set it to the false if your binding does not reference other schema in the top level uh, so there is no top level dollar ref then most likely you want to use additional properties false almost actually 100 percent you want to use additional properties false and the example here is exactly that case so there's a list of properties there's some of them are required and additional properties false which means that nothing else is allowed only these properties are uh, expected now you might have a bit different case so you might have a top level reference and this example here shows the uh, panel binding which is using the or referencing the panel comma that yaml schema so this other binding comes with its own properties however you might not like all the properties you might just choose that yeah i write the binding for the panel but all these common panel bindings are not good for me therefore you can list which properties you want i want the backlight i want reset gpios and i assign them to true which means that i just want them to evaluate i don't define the type i don't define the description why because this other reference schema this panel common already tells me the type already tells me the uh, the description what is this i just have to mention it and then of course i also uh, finish the binding with additional properties false this means that no other properties which you list here are allowed including no other properties mentioned in the panel common this makes sense for certain cases uh, although if you reference other schema you rather would like to have such case so you would like to use unevaluated properties there are two examples here so typical is the regulator so there's a uh, this is actually pattern property but it doesn't matter there are there is the LDO actually there can be up to four LDOs and they reference regulator.yaml and finish with unevaluated properties false the example below is the same panel example as before just with unevaluated properties false this means that you reference the other schema and you accept all of the properties coming from this other schema from the regulator yaml or panel common yaml uh, you can add more properties and nothing else so nothing which was not evaluated is not accepted nothing else is allowed here so if you reference other schema most likely you would like to have uh, this um, style so you finish your binding with unevaluated properties false finally the binding finishes with the example so we want some one or two relevant examples which will validate the binding itself this is used during this uh, make dt binding check and it we use it for the purpose of testing the binding whether the binding is correct uh, it also serves as a purpose for example for anyone who will be uh, writing dts based on the binding there's really no point to have 10 examples if they differ by just compatible or free properties uh, because this is a pretty often obvious stuff uh, and unlike for the yaml we prefer here a four space indentation although uh, two space indentation for such dts examples also okay 
What about the example more? So we don't want there to have status. So status, okay, status uh, disabled is not relevant for this example. It's a pretty common mistake when you copy an example from GTS. Uh, and there is usually no need to provide some unnecessary pieces of other examples. So if you, for example, uh, if you have a binding for a clock provider, there is no point to give example of consumer of a clock because it's pretty obvious. We have thousands of consumers. Just provide the example for the same, for your device or the provider. The final rule, it's, which applies for all the DTS, so we prefer the node names to be generic, and uh, therefore the proper node name for this, for example, for ADC is ADC, not AD7190. Yeah, that would be pretty it. Uh, I have here reusable patterns, and as I mentioned, I will not be going through them. I leave them only if anyone would like to have some cheat sheet when working with your device tree bindings. So I will quickly go through it up to the thank you and the questions. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah? Could you go back to the beginning slide, please? I think it was. Where, which one? Wait, right at the beginning. I would like to speak up. The microphone's fairly quiet. Honest. Um, can you go back to the beginning? Beginning slide? Yeah. Sorry, I, it's where you say that, that one there. Um, so this is true for Linux. Um, the do not describe software policies is um, is something that Linux does because it has a user space. Uh, so other users of device tree, for example, uh, U-Boot allows that or needs that because there's you know, configuration goes there because it, it has to put it there, it can't put it anywhere else. And Zephyr is actually the same. And uh, perhaps that's the reason why Zephyr hasn't been upstreaming bindings, but it's certainly something that um, is now allowed in, in the DT schema as I understand it. Um, and so I just wanted to make that comment. So, so far, I think there was no case that actually someone was trying to upstream U-Boot bindings would have uh, the policy saying how U-Boot should behave. So we didn't have exactly, I think, that case that to say whether it's not or yes or no. So the policy here that we don't describe operating system policies is for the Linux. Uh, for the case of the U-Boot or other projects, this will be probably discussed and uh, yeah, therefore I made a disclaimer that uh, the further Linux open source uh, community might overrule this uh, talk. Yeah, but it's a valid point. Yeah, there's a, a question that far. Um, I have seen people mixing the syscon and simple MFD compatible strings recently quite a bit. Um, this is apparently not allowed, right? Is uh, there a reason behind that? Together. Together, yes. No, it's a, it is allowed. Yeah, it's okay. It's fine. So the only thing which you need to have is to have a specific compatible. Uh, what? Rob Herring was saying on the mailing list that actually he believes that this is contradictory. So if something is Cisco, it actually cannot be a simple MFD. Uh, and he's complaining about this on mailing list. However, he accepts this. So <laughs> it's a, a rule by uh, practice. So it's okay. So this is okay to use. We are not supposed to like create some sort of a wrapper drivers which would do the subnode scanning. Um, this is okay. This is okay. For, if you follow the rule that simple MFD cannot have any other resources for the children, so the children cannot depend on resources. Ah, okay. So, because this is the rule of the simple MFD, so the only resource coming from the parent is the IO address space, so the, the register, uh, special register region space. Gotcha, thanks. So, we actually ran into an issue in TI um, when we were using the J720 controller. I didn't get that. Uh, Is this better? Yeah. So we did run into an issue at TI well, with the device trees. So we ended up using um, like TI J720 system controller. 
uh, along with uh, the syscall. Then we realized that uh, the register accesses can overlap, and it depends on the driver how the request is going to happen. So what we are trying to do is to get away from syscall entirely with simple bus. So if I got correctly, one conclusion was to get away from the syscall. And yeah, it's a uh, it's nice shortcut, the same as simple MFD, but if you start using such compatibility in your SOD design, then actually you limit yourself and then you might have troubles further in your upstreaming process. So. Okay, any other questions? Oh yeah, there is. Um, it's a little out of this time. Uh, I noticed that sometimes warnings appear when you update your DTC or, or whatever, because this new, you know, it discovers new things that it doesn't like. And then you get a lot of warnings that, were, you know, for files that were previously valid and now not. Is that something that's continuing or are we, have we reached the end of that? So if I got the question, you mean how to reduce the amount of warnings when you do the validation or can you refresh? Uh, so go back three years. I run DTC, it gives me no warnings on a particular DT. I do, I do it now, it produ produces 50 warnings because DT is checking, DTC is checking a lot more stuff. Um, I mean, I'm just wondering, have we, are, will that continue? Because it's annoying because you've got perfectly valid DTs that now produce warnings, you know, six months later. So the answer is probably that there will be still warnings going, but it's up to you to fix them. Uh, so one of the answers, how I became the device free bindings maintainer is just I was converting a lot of things, a lot of things and fixing the DTSs on the way. So uh, it's, you know, community effort. And the point is that, yeah, we have a lot of warnings. So with all of the automation tools and someone has to fix them. And the DT, uh, DTC, so the DT compiler warnings are also should be fixed. I don't think that there are requirements for the system ready but it would be actually nice to have the platforms without them. There's a question further. Hey, th this is more of a kind of a conceptual question, but um, say for example, check patch has this parameter fix, fix in place, which can just attempt to fix the errors for you. Is there any chance that the DT tooling will have something similar-ish and that it will, it will attempt to fix the errors for you in the bind, in the DT source? DT not, but uh, chat GPT can. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh, so uh, if we describe entire DTS in the binding, so because there are also values, let's say that you miss interrupts or you, you miss some GPIOs, but what is the value for the GPO? or the interrupts. You can actually write it in the bind. You can create so complex binding that it describes every value and you can generate DTS out of the binding. But of course, yeah. I, I don't think that's the point. I mean, fix basic errors like node is called like ADS 74 something something instead of ADC. That, that kind of errors I think could be fixed already, right? Based on the bindings. Yeah, probably such simple things, uh, yeah, there could be. And what could be probably improved also the errors coming from the TT schema. So when it finds some mistakes in your bindings and produces a very interesting error, which is quite ch sometimes challenged to decipher, so. Yes, thanks. <laughs> yeah, one more question here. It's quite overrunning. <laughs> it's healthy exercise. <laughs> Uh, why why and choose a uh, license uh, for uh, a dual license? Why why choose dual dual license for uh, DT by by DT file? Uh, the question is why do we have dual license for the bindings? Because you want them to be used in other projects, uh, which might have different uh, licenses. So not everything runs on GPL. Uh, there are some BSD things as well. Thanks. Yeah, I guess that's it. Oh, no, 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 one more. <laughs> oh, I was wondering, in the example you had for the DT schema check, um, it didn't have the checker flag, but the bot seems to ask for dash M. Is that important to have? Uh, 
this uh, DT checker flag dash M? Uh, no. So this uh, when the rope runs its bot, which scans all your patches, it runs with this DT checker flag, which also checks whether actually your binding does not uh, whether it references the example in the example the binding which you want to put there. So basically, it tests whether the example matches the binding because if you test one binding and you put the irrelevant example, then your check, local check would be fine and you would not notice that the example doesn't match. But when you submit, uh, I mean, uh, skip this flag and it will be also perfectly fine. And if something is wrong, then Rob will correct it. I mean, the, the bot will correct it. Uh, back to a question that was asked uh, earlier, the first one. There's a comment on the chat about how to validate an external DTP, DTS. So I never tried it. Uh, how it's to? It's available. Uh, how to? Uh, ah, there's a comment. How to do it? Yes, yes. Explaining. Ah, good. So, if, so that's for how to validate the yeah, With DTP, the, uh, virtual. Pass, uh, a path to a DTP, well, wherever it is. Great. And cool. And to the decent file. Okay. Anything more? Then I guess that's it. So thank you very much for coming. <laughs>